Hey guys, this video is on UV vis spectroscopy. It's a lab technique that we're going to use throughout the year, so now is as good a time as any. All right, so in your introductory chemistry course, whatever it was, you should have gone over the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, this is a little bit different from any of the ones I've ever found. I found this one in German, and they actually put alternating current up here at the top. That's not something that we usually do in the US, but I thought, hey, why not? So I put it up there. Uh, usually ours is cut off right around here at about um, 10 to the third or 1,000 um, meters of wavelength. So I just thought it was interesting that they put this up here. Uh, okay, so what we're going to be looking at for this lab is mostly in the visible light spectrum and in the UV spectrum. So it really only takes place right through here. All the rest of this we're not going to be using, but I wanted to remind you that it exists, right? Because um, we'll look at it later. So uh, valence electron excitation happens in the UV um, and, and, and in the visible spectrum too. Uh, what that basically means is if you have an atom and these are its valence electrons, so they're the outermost electrons, they can get excited into a higher energy um, orbital. Okay, so UV light and uh, visible light can do that to atoms. All right, their uh, valence electrons can get excited from the light shining on them. Uh, X ray actually does core electron excitation, IR does molecular vibrations. We might look that look at that a little bit closer later. And then <clears throat> if you've ever heard of NMR, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. Um, or had an MRI done, uh, nuclear spin states are affected. Um, so radio waves affect those as long as it's inside of a magnetic field. Uh, but what we're going to focus on for this is just UV vis visible light spectrum. All right, so when we shine UV light or visible light on something, it can make the outer electrons transition to a higher energy level. And the wavelength range for ultraviolet is about 400 nanometers to 1 nanometer, and the visible light is 750 nanometers to 400 nanometers. So just to put that into perspective in meters, that would be 7.5 times 10 to the negative seventh meters to 4 uh, times 10 to the negative seventh meters. And then uh, you should be able to convert between nanometers and meters very quickly. So there's 1 times 10 to the ninth nanometers in 1 meter. Okay, so um, a billion. There's a billion nanometers in a meter. All right, so when we look at uh, UV vis spectroscopy, it really is helpful to understand the color wheel and how colors work with each other. So when UV or visible light is shown on some compounds, it can be absorbed. So the light gets absorbed by the compound and it makes the color uh, of the, as you see, of the solution. So like copper solutions can be blue or greenish and that happens because of complementary colors. So complementary colors lie across the wheel from each other. Um, and so if we look at that a little bit closer, if you see a red solution, it's because it's absorbing the blue green color uh, light. And so remember that uh, white light or the light that we see in a light bulb um, that's white light, not yellow, but white, um, is actually all the colors of the rainbow mixed together. That's why when you shine it through a prism, it separates them into the rainbow that we see. Or like a rainbow in the sky is separated because the raindrops or the, the water in the air is actually separating the light that's being shined by the sun. So it's acting as a prism. Um, so the color of a compound that you see with your eyes, the complement of the color of the light absorbed by a colored compound. Thus, it completes the color. So if you have, if you see a purple solution, it's absorbing green light. If you see a dark blue solution, um, they put purple here. It's really darker blue, purplish as to yellow, and then blue to orange, and then red to blue green. All right. 
So the way UV vis spectroscopy works, it looks very complicated. It's really not, but I thought it was important that you see a diagram like this now, because um, they get way more complicated when we uh, when they talk about uh, more difficult things to explain. Okay, so when you see something like that, that means that um, it's 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 light. Okay, so it's coming from from all dimensions and it's being shown on something. All right, so they lock up the complementary colors here where red is to green and orange is to blue and yellow is to purple. Um, and so they have this beam source right here and it's shining the light onto the solution right here, right? Um, we sh when we shine the light on here and the atom, the electron, not the atom, but the electron goes up in energy right it absorbs the light and goes up in energy then what we actually see that's transmitted through the sample is the red color the red light all right and so when we look over here at this right the number of photons is on the y-axis and then we have all the colors here on the x-axis what gets absorbed by the sample is the green one and so this red line down here is the absorption spectrum. That's what we're going to look at most of the time. So you notice that the wavelength where the green is, it gets absorbed there. And then if we look at transmission, transmission means it's allowed to go through. Uh, so the green is not allowed to go through the solution, but everything else is. All right, so spec spectrophotometers, we have this one, right? It's it's very big and bulky. It's in the back of the lab. I don't really like to use them anymore because uh, of all the calibration that has to happen every time we use it. And then we have the little spectrovis uh, verniers, and they work very well for what we do. All right. So if we're looking at the absorption spectrum for blue dye, all right, um, we could run it through, uh, put our sample. They come in these little square vials called cuvettes and we could put it inside of here and we could set it to where it would go through all the different wavelengths and we could find the best wavelength to run our sample at and so if we look at the absorbance here um, the best absorbance is right here right and that's at about 630 nanometers for the the blue dye all right and so that would be our wavelength max and that that would be the one that we would want to measure this at because all the other ones we're not going to get a very good reading for it okay and then what you need to do is set your blank to zero so we would actually then put a cuvette in there with just water because that's our solvent right um, if your solvent was alcohol or if you're putting the same concentration of an ion in the solution every time, uh, then you'd probably want to include that. But <clears throat> most of the time, it's what you want to blank out of your sample. Okay, so we don't want the blue dye to blank out. We just want the water that the blue dye is dissolved in to blank out. So we're going to put that in there. And then we would create a calibration curve. And so that's what we're going to look at in a minute is the calibration curves and how those are done. All right, so... Um, light of a particular wavelength passes into a sample, right? And so this is a cuvette, it is a little square container, and light is absorbed by molecules or particles at different wavelengths, reducing light transmission. So if you have a blue solution, it will absorb a large amount of yellow light. The yellow light will not reach the detector. The more yellow light absorbed, the higher the concentration of the blue solution. All right. So absorbance is the value that represents the amount of light that was absorbed by the sample. And there's some other stuff like transmittance and how to find absorbance from transmittance. We're not going to get into all that. All I want you to know is that absorbance is equal to epsilon BC. Okay. And if you look closely at that, it is a linear equation where Y is, or A is on the Y axis, right? So I'm going to draw my Thing here so absorbance is on the y-axis and then we have concentration on the x-axis and then the slope of the line would be equal to epsilon beta or epsilon b where b is the path length 
and the path length is the distance it takes to get through the cuvette from one side to the other so the distance the light has to travel all right and e is called or epsilon is molar absorptivity and molar absorptivity is to a specific substance so what we can do here is if we get enough points of known concentration and known absorbances we can get a curve and then unknown concentrations can be determined from that so let's look at this example all right it says several solutions were made of increasing concentrations of a red dye and the corresponding concentrations were determined an absorbance of 0.39 was determined at 505 nanometers for a solution with an unknown concentration of the red dye what is the concentration of the unknown solution all right so we made a bunch of different solutions so the blank is zero right and then we made a standard one which is 0.15 of the red dye a standard two of 0 0.30 a standard three of 0.45 and a standard four of 0.6 because we were trying to measure the amount of red dye trying to measure the amount of red dye in this sample we had no idea what it was so I'm gonna whoa gonna graph absorbance versus concentration so I just stick these into the spectrophotometer and measure the absorbances of these right so I found my wavelength max to be 505 nanometers obviously somewhere along the way and then I measure all of these at that wavelength so I made this sample measured it made this sample measured it made this sample measured it made this sample and measured it and now I can graph them all right so I'm gonna go ahead and do that it's like magic right and um, okay so here's all my points from the data that I obtained in the lab from all of this and then I can say okay so here's my line that's the equation of our line and remember when we're using this we're using Beer's law and it is basically absorbance is equal to epsilon B C where C is X and that's what we're looking for so I have the absorbance of the sample I can stick it in the spectrophotometer I don't have to know what the concentration is to put it in in the cuvette and stick it in the machine and get a reading out so now I can plug in my absorbance here I have E and B right here because it's the slope and then I just have to solve for C so if I do that I'm gonna have 0 0.39 is equal to 1.64 my slope of this line times X minus 0 0.002 okay and so now I can solve for X I'm gonna add 0 0.002 to both sides so I get 0 0.392 it's going to be equal to 1.64 X so divide by 1.64 on both sides and my X is equal to 0.239 okay so just to make sure that I didn't make a mistake anywhere I notice that this is 0.39 absorbent so that's about 0.4 um, and it falls right there which is about 0.23 right it's about a third of the way to 0.3 okay so that must be right now one thing that I included on here that I wanted you to see was r squared and r squared is basically telling you how straight your line is the closer it is to one the more these points agree, agree with each other in a linear relationship and so since this is 0 0.9993 that's pretty close all right um, it should at least be 0.99 for it to be reasonable to use really don't have a problem with the machines that we use in the classroom as long as your dilutions were made properly alright so we will do this in lab more than once um, this year